Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Hamel Hussein. He's a staff machine learning engineer at GitHub. His focus is on creating developer tools powered by machine learning. Previously, Hamel was a data scientist at Airbnb, where he worked on growth marketing and a data robot where he helped build automated machine learning tools for data scientists. He also regularly contributes to open source projects, which recently include Fast.ai, Jupyter, and Kuberflow. For more on Hamel's background, you can check out the bio widget on your screen. I would also like to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Jeremy Howard is a data scientist, researcher, developer, educator, and entrepreneur. He's a founding researcher at FAST.AI, a research institute dedicated to making deep learning more accessible. He's also a distinguished research scientist at the University of San Francisco, the chair of Wicklow AI at Medicine Research Initiative, and is chief scientist at Platform.AI. Previously, Jeremy was the founding CEO of Enlytic, which was the first company to apply deep learning to medicine and was selected as one of the world's top 50 smartest companies by MIT Tech Review two years running. He was the president and chief scientist of the data science platform Kaggle, where he was the top ranked participant in international machine learning competitions two years running. He was the founding CFO, CEO of two successful Australian startups, Fastmail and Optimal Decision Group, the latter of which was purchased by LexisNexis. Jeremy has invested in, mentored, and advised many startups and contributed to many open source projects. He has written for The Guardian, USA Today, and The Washington Post, and is a frequent guest on TV shows, and has a highly popular tech talk on TED.com, The Wonderful and Terrifying Implications of Computers That Can Learn. Jeremy is also a co-founder of the Global Mask for All movement. Jeremy, without further ado, take it away. Thanks so much, Jan. Um, today I want to talk about um, some pretty successful experiments we've been making in the last few years around applying some, I guess, fairly basic software engineering principles to uh, the development of um, deep learning software uh, and uh, deep learning research, which um, for software engineers amongst you might sound like a pretty obvious thing to do. It's software, so you should use good software engineering. But um, surprisingly, um, a lot of pretty basic software engineering principles have not been well followed in deep learning software development so far. And so I want to show you some uh, successes we've had in, in following some of these kinds of principles. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, uh, I work at fast.ai, which is a self-funded uh, research and development lab. And uh, we do a number of things. We uh, build software, um, provide education, um, do uh, basic academic research and publish papers and develop a community all around the idea of making deep learning more accessible. Uh, when we started doing this a few years ago, deep learning really was um, pretty much exclusively the domain of a very, very small number of highly qualified academics who did not really have a very broad range of backgrounds. Um, and I'm happy to say that um, with our work and the work of uh, other organizations and people, um, deep learning is becoming increasingly more accessible. And so when I say accessible, that means uh, it should need uh, less educational background, less data, less compute resources, less money, um, and so forth. So, um, uh, at Fasted AI, I've uh, built uh, a number of things, uh, a number of software libraries uh, in particular, uh, generally around the deep learning space. A lot of them have been pretty popular, um, most particularly the Fast AI library, uh, which is a um, layered API for deep learning, which a lot of people use. Uh, it sits on top of the uh, PyTorch Foundation. Um, and um, uh, we'll be talking a lot about that today. 
um, uh, Fast AI, the library, and this book, Deep Learning for Coders with Fast AI and PyTorch, were both written by me along with uh, Sylvain Gouger. Um, and uh, our book, Deep Learning for Coders, has been super popular, and a lot of people um, that you might have heard of, like Peter Norvig and Eric Topol, uh, say it's really good as well. Um, the uh, the enti the entire book is available for free, um, uh, or you can purchase a paper copy, um, and uh, all of the software is available for free as well. Um, I mentioned education. Uh, uh, our um, course um, is um, very popular, and as you can see, people really like it, and the course covers um, kind of end-to-end -end how to get started with deep learning all the way up to um, becoming a world-class researcher and reading papers and developing new algorithms and implementing them in software and so forth. Um, so uh, one of the really interesting things about fast.ai is it's, um, um, well, nowadays it's really um, just me in terms of people actually working full-time on this. Uh, for much of the last couple of years, it was also with Sylvain Gouger. Um, uh, and so one of the things people often ask me is how to, you know, one slash two people do so much um, and, you know, not just doing a lot of work, but high quality work that people like. And one of uh, my secret weapons is um, a, a critical thing for software engineering, something called NB Dev. Um, NB Dev is a uh, software development platform that sits on top of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, Jupyter Notebooks uh, was first and foremost really developed as an interactive scientific computing platform. Um, but it turns out that um, with an interactive platform like Jupyter, um, oh, I've got a car alarm, that's a bit unfortunate. <laughs> that's not so loud, you can't hear me. I think I see somebody coming to turn it off. Yeah. All right, <laughs> bad timing. Um, where was I? So um, uh, the thing about Jupyter, as an interactive environment, it's a really a great environment for literate programming and exploratory programming, um, which uh, have many decades of, of uh, research and development from people like Donald Knuth, uh, Brett Victor, Ivan Sutherland. Um, and literate and exploratory programming are approaches where we treat the practice of programming as a discussion with a human being, not just with a computer, and where we incorporate uh, video and pictures and prose, and we also are working with live code objects rather than just working in a text editor. Jupyter gives us all that, and what MB Dev puts on top of it is the ability to take that exploratory programming process and turn it into a um, publishable Python module, um, searchable documentation, um, projects that you can install from Pip and Conda. Um, uh, testing, continuous integration, and so forth. Um, Chris Latner, who's been one of the driving forces behind uh, uh, literate programming and exploratory programming uh, through his work on Swift Playgrounds, this is the guy who invented Swift and LLVM, amongst other things, has described NBDev as a huge step forward in programming environments, which was a really exciting thing um, for me to hear, um, because for me, Chris has been somebody I've really admired in this space. So what does it look like? Well, FastAI, um, uh, the library was built with NBDev. Um, and if you look at the FastAI documentation, you will see that the uh, description of a method uh, includes its signature, a link to the uh, source code, um, uh, details and links about where it might have come from, the paper that's used that it implements, sample code, sample outputs from that code that can be any kind of media, um, and this documentation, one of the really cool things is that it was actually this entire, all the documentation was written with Jupyter Notebooks, which means we can pop a link at the top of every page. This is automatically done by NBDev, which lets a user open up the documentation itself in Colab. And Colab is a uh, free environment where you can run um, Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud uh, on GPUs. And so here is the exact same thing now running inside Colab. And this is really great because it means that no longer is documentation just a, a static thing that you read, but it's an interactive thing that you experiment with. 
And um, that's also good for us because when we're writing documentation, we're always thinking about how can we provide the most rich and useful experimental interface for learning about this this code or this API or this feature. Um, we're not just thinking like, oh, let's just throw some text out there and hope it makes sense. Um, so then also those notebooks, the same notebooks are not just documentation, but the actual library itself is written in those same notebooks. And the tests are also written in those same notebooks. So everything is in one place. And the nice thing about that is that when somebody comes along and says, oh, I'm going to maybe do a PR to add a feature or add a missing test, all the information for the, you know, the implementation, so here's the actual implementation you can see of the of the code um, and the examples and tests and the descriptions and details are all there in one place. Um, so it really helps people to spin up on a project very quickly. Or if I go back to something I was doing a year ago, I can quickly remind myself of what I was doing and why. Um, and then uh, a single NB dev command runs all the tests in all the notebooks and tells you how it went. And furthermore, that is automatically um, um, added to continuous integrations, where every time you push to any project that was built from NBDev, all your tests are run and you're notified of any failures. So all this stuff happens from a single um, settings file, which has all the information needed to build your documentation, to build your library, um, uh, to run your tests, um, uh, to install your project, uh, including things like uh, dependencies, um, and, you know, this is uh, really important because one of the basic software engineering principles is don't repeat yourself, DIY. And so often we see configuration information repeated in multiple places or at least split over multiple places. So one of the basic software engineering principles we try to really stick to is there should be just one place to um, set up your project, um, not split over multiple places and certainly not um, replicated over multiple places. So with nbdev, it all sits in one file called settings.ini and everything gets read from there regardless of what it's for. Um, now, um, exploratory programming environments like Jupyter are great for, I find, most things most of the time. And here's some examples of actual source code from nbdev. Um, and as you can see, the nbdev source code itself is written in nbdev as notebooks. Um, and then there's a synchronization process that automatically turns that into what you see on the right, which is the actual module. Um, sometimes, though, it's actually easier to do some things in a text editor, like some, you know, like a quick search and replace, or if you're jumping around between tags and stuff like that. So one really nice thing is that every part of the um, module knows, as you can see from the comments, which part of the notebook it came from. So you can also sync back changes in the editor back into the notebook. Uh, so you can work in wherever, you're, um, wherever you find it most convenient. So, you know, most of the software engineering practices that most people use nowadays are focused around the text editor environment. Um, I would like to see much more move towards um, a live exploratory coding environment like Jupyter. Um, um, but I think each of those tools is good for different things. And so it's really important to be able to synchronize back and forth between the two, which we can. Um, one nice thing about nbdev is that um, we try to ensure that documentation makes really good use of hyperlinks. And this is kind of another example of don't repeat yourself. Um, rather than explaining in documentation what everything is every time you see it, you should just be able to hyperlink to it. Um, but you shouldn't have to create a hyperlink manually for code because code can figure out where it is documented. So here is what documentation looks like in Markdown as we write it in the notebook. Uh, we just put code symbol names in backticks. And then nbdev automatically figures out what those refer to. And as you can see, it then automatically creates hyperlinks to them. And it can figure out which things are actually parameter names and don't actually have hyperlink documentation, for instance. And it can even hyperlink to, as it has here, um, uh, documentation from different libraries. So nbdev is actually an ecosystem. And any nbdev project registers its own symbol documentation with the central nbdev registry. And then all other nbdev projects will automatically create uh, links to each other's documentation. Um, and all you have to do is put things in backticks.
So the documentation that's then generated has all of the stuff you might hope to see. It's got an index of pages, which can be hierarchical, and table of contents, the uh, opening collab that we mentioned, badges, so on and so forth. Um, so it ends up with a really uh, nice experience for your users. Um, another cool thing is that, again, it's kind of the don't repeat yourself software engineering principle, is um, the information that you put into your documentation homepage actually comes from a notebook called index, index.ipynb. And the index notebook, uh, here's an example of the top of the index notebook uh, from Jupyter for fast AI. Um, that actually automatically becomes your readme file. So it's automatically turned down into a markdown readme file. It's also automatically turned into your documentation homepage. And it's also automatically turned into the description for your PyPy and Conda installers. So again, we kind of try to make sure that um, you just put your information in one place. In this case, it's like, this is what my library is and how you install it and what the basic features are. And you put it in your index notebook and then it appears everywhere else that people might want to see it automatically. So one of the things I like about this is that um, starting an NB dev project takes about 30 seconds. Um, you just type NB dev new and you type the name of the project and away you go. And that means that I use NB dev even for really small things. Um, so, for example, recently I wanted to create something which would um, uh, automatically send a tweet every time there was a new release of any fast.ai um, project on GitHub. So I created a little thing I called fast webhook that would um, have a, run a little Python web server and would listen for uh, Git webhook calls and when receiving them it would send a tweet. So normally that's the kind of thing we might do as a little script just for ourselves. But I, um, because everything's just easier to do in NBDev in the first place, I wrote it in NBDev, um, which means that I can, as you can see, I can actually document as I go, how does Python's HTTP server itself actually work? Here's actually a test showing you an example of an unbuffered server. Um, and so you can see here, again, the kind of the implementations and the tests and the documentation all mixed up together for this pretty simple little thing that I just spent a couple of hours um, building. And that means then I could actually release that um, to uh, PyPy and Conda. So now anybody else can download from PyPy or Conda um, this library, even though it's just a quick little thing I built for myself, anybody else now can use it if they want to. Um, and so this is, this is nice, right? Because it means that now your projects don't just have to be little things that you keep for yourself. Um, they're, automatically they're gonna have documentation, um, pip installers, uh, Conda installers, a readme file, continuous integration, it's all just done for free. So part of, for us, helping data scientists and um, in particular the deep learning community um, use better software engineering practices was to provide this tool that would kind of give you the basic software engineering tooling that professional programmers are kind of used to having in their day-to-day -day jobs in, the, in their, where they work, but now you can have it as part of all of your normal projects as well. And you know, your, your kind of hobby projects or your scientific experiment projects or whatever. So this means that data scientists or other um, domain experts who aren't necessarily day-to-day full-time programmers um, can kind of, without spending too much time thinking about it, get all of the software uh, development best practices, or well, not all of them, but uh, quite a few of them up and running um, without really having to think about it. So that's the first piece of kind of bringing software engineering to deep learning is to help data scientists uh, get started with the actual development practices. Um, uh, the second is um, the design of fast AI, the library itself, which I'll tell you a bit about. But first of all, I'll give you some examples of some of the kind of research which is embedded into fast AI um, and some of the kind of benefits uh, that we have from that research. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did at fast.ai was we um, entered a competition to try to train um, ImageNet and SciFAR 10, which are maybe the two most popular um, computer vision data sets. And uh, there was a competition to see who could train them the fastest to a pretty high accuracy. 
And um, much to the surprise of a lot of people, and I was a bit surprised myself, uh, we won some of the uh, main parts of that competition, beating companies like uh, Google and Intel and getting a lot of notice. Um, uh, before we started, actually, it, it took you know well over 12 hours to train ImageNet. Um, Google early on in the competition got it to about down to about six hours at first. Um, we actually got it down to 18 minutes um, using standard off-the-shelf hardware that anybody has access to to rent for a few dollars. Um, and that was really a case of um, showing people how to do simple things um, uh, that that people maybe hadn't thought about much before. Um, another example of some of our research successes has been um, we helped kick off what's been kind of called the ImageNet moment in NLP, which is the development of fine-tuned language models. Um, our algorithm called ULMFIT uh, fairly directly led to the development at OpenAI of GPT and kind of kicked off um, a whole series of, of research breakthroughs around the idea that language models can make a big difference to uh, understanding real human, um, uh, or, or at least responding appropriately to real human language. Um, and um, again, this was really a case of uh, trying to show the research community about how some fairly uh, simple, um, inexpensive, easy to understand approaches can make a really big difference. Um, so some of the kinds of things that we've done along the way was to say, gosh, you know, normally when training models, there's so many hyperparameters you have to tune. And the traditional approach to that has been um, to spend lots and lots of money uh, searching across a whole wide range of different parameters. And you end up, you know, there's a lot of products available from companies like Microsoft and Google, where you can buy a huge amount of compute for thousands of dollars and run lots of experiments. Um, instead, we just, um, as humans, ran some experiments to see if we could figure out whether there's some hyperparameters that just seem to work pretty well or some simple, pretty simple ways to set them. And one of the things we did um, was, uh, along with uh, uh, a number of uh, fellows, uh, was to try out uh, lots of different data sets across lots of different hyperparameters. And we actually found a set of hyperparameters uh, in this column here, where um, they were basically the best or close to the best for every data set that we looked at. And so these are the kinds of things that we then put into fast AI as defaults um, so that we try to make it so that when you run, when you train a model in fast AI, you're going to get a close to state of the art result without having to think too much about it um, a lot of the time. Um, similar thing with optimizers, there's actually been a lot of really interesting development in the world of optimizers over the last year or so. Um, optimizers are the things which try to figure out, like, how do I make a slightly better set of parameters and then repeat that millions and millions of times um, in order to train a neural network. And we found, uh, you know, some particular approaches to optimization, which again, basically work pretty much all the time. Um, and we make those a default. So again, people don't really have to think about it um, to get close to world class or you know close to best of class results. Um, one of the things that really helps though to train models when they're not training well initially is to um, look inside them. And generally they have uh, hundreds of millions of weights or parameters. And so you can't look at all of them. Uh, so along with some of our students, we developed this really nice way of drawing pictures of each layer. In this case, the x-axis is um, uh, time or, or batches. And the y-axis is a histogram uh, at each column uh, of the activations for that batch uh, for that layer. And what it shows here is that the activations are getting um, higher and higher and higher and then collapsing and then going higher and collapsing and going higher and collapsing, higher and collapsing. And this picture, which we call the colorful dimension, um, developed with uh, one of our students, Stefan, um, we've discovered is a really great snapshot where once you've looked at a few, you quickly get a sense from this one picture of how my model's training. And if it's not training well, why isn't it training well? And this particular picture, where particularly at the later layers, you get um, 
increasing activations and then collapsing activations is a sure sign of a network that's not going to end up training very well. Um, and so using this picture, we were able to develop a new activation function we called generalized ReLU that as soon as we turned it on, basically totally removed that that problem. And uh, we found it as a result in stable training and we would get much better accuracies um, a lot of the time. So um, people really notice when um, these kinds of best practices that come out of research are embedded in the software they use. Um, so for example, this person here uh, said that they just recently started experimenting with fast AI and they found that again and again, it outperformed my TensorFlow 2.0 models despite using the same architectures, optimizers and loss functions. Um, and the question on the forum was like, how is this possible? <laughs> um, and then somebody else replied and said, yep, yeah, that's what we found. We spent months tweaking TensorFlow and then we switched to fast AI and immediately we got better results. Um, so the basic kind of software engineering principle here is really about um, good defaults and um, ensuring that the, the for things where the, you, the computer needs to be told to do something, you, you only ask a human the minimum amount. If the, if the computer can figure it out for itself, then have it figure it out for itself. Um, so that's what we do, at least, you know, the kind of the default configuration is we try to make sure everything, you just tell, the, the API is just enough to say, like, these are the things that, that can't be figured out automatically. Um, and then everything else, uh, the, you know, you can change it, but uh, they're either, configured automatically based on what you've said, or there are sensible uh, and well-studied defaults for them. Um, so um, how do we do all that? Um, well, the trick is uh, to use a very uh, carefully layered API. Um, so again, this is a pretty standard software engineering principle of layered APIs and careful decoupling. Um, but it hadn't been much used in deep learning <coughs> libraries before. Um, there was a little bit, um, but once you kind of started digging under the covers of the top level user facing API, you would quickly find this kind of real mess of, of, of one off functions. Um, so with fast AI, we've made sure that each layer of the API is, is fully documented and is designed to be something that you can hack at and change and then everything else will work mm -hmm. together with your changes. Mm -hmm. So starting by looking at the top layer, what do actually users work with? Um, most users are going to work with the applications layer, where there are four applications. Um, and uh, everything I'm describing here is actually much more fully documented in our peer-reviewed paper and information. Um, so go check that out if you'd like to learn more about any of this. Um, so the four uh, applications, the first one is fastai.vision, which does a wide range of computer vision, um, deep learning modeling activities. Um, for example, here's a complete end-to-end uh, -end, uh, file that will train um, an image classifier uh, to recognize 37 different dog and cat breeds. Um, now, the key thing to note isn't at this stage the uh, details of the API, but the fact that there's really one, two, three, four, depending on how you count it, lines of code. Um, and the error rates we're getting are pretty close to state of the art, and it takes about 30 seconds to run. So this is an image classifier. Uh, so where does the information come from? Um, how do you get the labels from that? Um, uh, what transformations do you want to do? Uh, what normalization do you want to do? Uh, what kind of model do you want to build? What metrics do you want to print out? Um, so if we look, on the other hand, at another fast.ai.vision um, example, which is segmentation. Uh, so here's something that is looking at trying to color code every pixel in an image to say whether it's road or sky or building or car or so forth. You can see it's the same um, basic uh, four lines of code. Um, uh, and again, we can train it, and um, in a few minutes we get um, basically state-of-the-art results, or very close to state-of-the-art results. So by carefully designing this API, it means that you would learn the API once uh, for one application, then you can use it across other applications. So you can see we've got the same basic four lines of code here to train a, um, in this case it's a text classifier, 
um, which is um, predicting uh, whether or not uh, this is a positive or negative sentiment. So once you've learned the vision API, you already know the text API. Um, here's the same basic four lines of code to do a tabular learner. This is something that looks at things like CSV files and spreadsheets and database tables. And this one is predicting um, somebody's, um, I think it's predicting their income level based on things like their education level and occupation and, and demographic data. Um, so again, you know, same basic four lines of code. For collaborative filtering, for recommendations, the same again, basic four lines of code. So um, this software engineering principle is all about um, um, trying to keep things as consistent as possible. And if there's differences between APIs, it should be because they're necessary for, um, for the domain, um, not because it's just more convenient from an implementation point of view. So we try to provide a very um, uh, consistent picture across all of the different applications of like how to interact with them um, to minimize the amount of learning you have to do as you move from problem to problem. Um, one of the reasons we were able to build that um, uh, application API is because it's built on top of this really nice um, mid-tier. And the mid-tier API is not something that's designed to just be deep inside the library and that you shouldn't have to worry about. We actually um, uh, carefully document this. It's uh, included in the book is, is how to use it. Um, in fact, all the layers are. Um, because the idea is that if you're a researcher or, or whatever and you need to go a little bit deeper on some part of the training process, um, Perhaps there's some performance issue for your particular domain that you need to improve, or there's something you think you might be able to change to make your accuracy better. You should be able to go as deep as you like in that area and try things out and change things, and everything above it should continue to work. Um, so the mid-tier API... Um, ...starts with... Um, uh, I'll, I'll explain it starting with the, uh, the training loop, and these slides were written by uh, Sylvain Gouger. Um, uh, this is the basic uh, PyTorch training loop. Um, to fit a model, you go through each epoch. For each epoch, you go through each independent and dependent variable of your mini batches. You make a prediction by calling the model. You calculate the loss by calling your loss function with the predictions and the targets. Uh, you calculate the gradients, and then you step the optimizers and reset the optimizers. Um, so this is the basic cycle. Prediction from the model, calculate the loss, get the radiance, gradients, do the optimizer step. Repeat until your model is hopefully really good. Um, but um, there's a lot of tweaks that in practice you will always want to add. For example, you might want to attach to some kind of um, uh, tracking system like um, our own fast progress that you see here, or I think this is TensorBoard, or weights and biases, or so forth. Um, you're probably going to want to add some kind of hyperparameter scheduler, such as um, SGDR or um, OneCycle. Um, you're probably going to want to add various kinds of regularization, of which there are um, countless range that you can try out. Um, and then there's more complex things you might want to do, um, such as GANs. So in practice, um, what used to happen prior to fast AI was people would generally write a whole new training loop each time. And it wasn't just to add one of those features, but for each kind of combination of those features you want to try, you have to either modify the previous training loop you had um, or um, or create a new training loop, and you kind of end up with this whole mess of different approaches which are not consistent with each other, and it's so easy to make mistakes, and it takes such a long time. Um, in FastAI, uh, the previous version of FastAI, this is our training loop, we just made a really, really big training loop, um, which tried to incorporate a whole range of different things. Um, and this is what most... Uh, training loops, uh, most li uh, library training loops still look like today. Um, 
But we refactored it. And so the key uh, software en engineering principle here is refactoring um, and in particular adding uh, hooks to allow users, including ourselves as users of the mid-tier API, to um, modify anything uh, without changing the basic structure um, using callbacks. Now, a lot of deep learning libraries have some kind of callbacks. Um, but they're generally pretty limited. They're generally, they can only um, read information, they can only read a subset of information, and they can only read that subset of information at a subset of times. Um, fast AI is unique in that every, every single part of the training process can have uh, uh, zero or more callbacks, as many as you like, and everyone can access every part of the system and can change every part of the system, including changing what happens next. They can also describe the relationship between each other and how they should be ordered. Um, they're incredibly flexible, a really uh, interesting new approach to this. Um, so this is our original training loop. Um, and so basically uh, with callbacks, that training loop ends up embedded in something that's calling a bunch of callbacks. So the training loop is still pretty simple, um, but it means that Everything we've wanted to do, um, and we've done dozens of different things, and our users have done thousands of different things, um, uh, can all be directly done as a little callback. Uh, so for example, gradient clipping is where if the gradients get really big, you cut them off at some maximum level. Um, so here is something that's um, after backwards. So after the backward pass runs, that calculates the gradients. Um, if, they're, if they're using clipping, then call the clip gradient norm function, passing in the parameters and passing in um, the amount to clip to. So you can see here that we're actually modifying the gradients themselves after they've been calculated just with a single line of code. Um, so you can mix these uh, different techniques together. Uh, these are a variety of the um, you know, small number of the huge number of different things that we've uh, added and our user community has added through callbacks. And one of the most important things here is that each of these are fully decoupled. So you can um, mix and match them together. So you can have loss penalties and gradient accumulation and mix up and one cycle training and bump. You just pop them all in and you don't have to think about it. It just works. Um, so for example, um, here is the really important uh, mix-up technique that was developed a couple of years ago. Um, and it's a technique which uh, basically takes um, uh, two images and takes a combination of those two images and a combination of their labels. It's a data augmentation technique. And as you can see, the implementation of mix-up as a callback, you know, is just a dozen or so lines of code. And uh, it runs very quickly on the GPU. Um, and can be combined with any of the other callbacks that I mentioned. And if you can compare that to the original paper, this is the implementation of mixup in the original mixup paper. It's much longer, right? And more importantly, um, all of the uh, things that are needed have to be combined into this one function. So for example, printing out a progress bar and deciding what metrics and so forth, they're all um, coupled in together. Um, so this is a really important software engineering principle is the idea of um, decoupling and uh, allowing these independent decoupled systems to integrate together to create something better than um, each part alone. Um, another example of the mid-tier API is the, um, uh, the optimizer. Um, before FastAI, every time somebody wanted to create a new optimizer, which is very often, uh, optimizers are a rapidly developing area of research, they would write it from scratch. So for example, uh, PyTorch has an optimizer called Adam W, which is actually one of the most useful optimizers around. Um, and uh, here is uh, the update step for Adam W from the PyTorch source code. Here's the Adam W update uh, from um, Fast AI. Uh, Adam W actually is identical to Adam, but we add in these three lines of code and this one part in gray. So it's basically like three and a half lines of code to add. And the reason for that was that we um, spent a lot of time refactoring. 
And it's interesting because when you look at um, deep learning research papers, it turns out that a lot of what gets published is basically um, is basically coming out of refactoring the algorithms. Um, so we actually tried to refactor all the optimization algorithms. So we read as many papers as we could, and we realized that there was a um, uh, two basic pieces that if we can combine them together, we could describe every optimizer, uh, that, uh, every paper that we could find, uh, which we call stats and steppers. Stats are basically things that keep track of what's going on in the parameters, and then steppers are things that use the parameters and the stats to figure out how to update um, the parameters. And by combining these two together, we were able to build um, uh, every uh, modern optimizer that we tried. Um, so for example, while we were building this um, uh, about 18 months ago, uh, the, uh, a paper that came out that showed how to reduce the training time for a really important algorithm called BERT from three days to 76 minutes using something called a LAM optimizer. So the key thing was they developed a new optimizer. Uh, we had it implemented by um, the end of the day when the paper came out. And the entire implementation is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines of code. Uh, and more importantly, the eight lines of code map really directly to the actual algorithm in the paper. So it really helps domain experts to, to map their, their math understanding directly to code and vice versa. Um, um, this was um, uh, very different to other libraries, which generally uh, took some months to implement the LAM paper. And when they did, it would be implemented from scratch as as pages of code. Um, so this is like I a, got some a, questions around this example. Yeah, hit me. So uh, people want to know, can you use these fast AI optimizers and some of these other tools with other libraries somehow, or do you have to? convert everything to fast AI. Yeah, so one of the important ideas of fast AI uh, software engineering principles is decoupling. And so all these things are decoupled. There are uh, defined documented APIs that each thing needs, and it works with that. So for example, um, the fast AI training loop can be used with um, any data you have in whatever format you have it, uh, and any existing code you have for working with that data. And we have, actually have examples in the fast AI docs that show how to take, how to basically take, um, if you've got some kind of legacy code that's like pure PyTorch or Catalyst or Ignite or you know one of these other training loops, we actually show how with um, no changes to your original code, you can start using the fast AI training loop with it. Um, and generally, it's like. Uh, you add like one or two lines of code, and you generally delete 30 or 40 lines of code. Uh, so yeah, they, they do work very well. Um, uh, you can mix and match very nicely. Um, things, the more bits of fast AI you use, the, the more extras you can use. So um, we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Um, but yeah, they're certainly designed to be well decoupled. Um, you mentioned that you implemented this in a day. And you also uh, kind of described how you've done a lot of things with just one person or two people full time um, and have developed this vast ecosystem with these software tools like MBDev. How do you think that these software tools like MBDev might have just as much impact as deep learning has on, uh, you know, developers generally? Or wh what do you feel? How do you feel about that? Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, it's possible. The the idea of that exploratory programming and literate programming could result in a kind of explosion in developer productivity has been a hope for decades. Um, and you know, even going back to like Ivan Sutherland um, in the '60s, there was always this hope that we would. You know that that people would flock to the idea of tools where they are directly interacting with the environment. You know things like Smalltalk were really founded on this principle. Um, for whatever reason, that hasn't happened yet, and um, it kind of feels like coders are—I don't know—they almost seem quite conservative. They kind of seem like pretty 
tied to the idea that text editors should look like text editors and um, that the, the, the process of programming should work in a certain way. Um, you know, I, I really admire people like um, Brett Victor and Chris Latner who have kind of shown us really interesting new ways of doing things. Um, I So I hope, yeah, I hope that NB Dev can help us um, move back in that direction. Um, I feel like it's it's there's not enough interest and um, momentum towards exploratory programming and real live coding environments. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I think if, if NB Dev can help people move in that direction, it could be quite transformational. One more question about this um, this topic of software engineering. So how how important is software engineering when if you're a deep learning practitioner and would you recommend the data scientists rotate through a traditional software engineering role to strengthen their st skills in this area? Um, it's a great question. Um, at the moment, I'd say yes, it probably is very important. I'd like it to be not important. I'd like it to, I'd like all the, you know, good approaches to be implicitly part of everything we do and that you wouldn't have to learn everything kind of like, it's like if you, start using NB Dev, for example, you, you get continuous integration and hyperlink documentation and all this stuff for free. Um, uh, and it's kind of stuff that software engineers are all used to having anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I do think at the moment, one of the differences between the most effective deep learning practitioners and data scientists more generally and the rest is how good they are at coding uh, including how they are, good they are at software engineering more generally. Um, so yeah, probably, I think it's a good thing to spend time practicing and learning about and ideally sitting with experts and learning from them. Sounds good. There's more questions, but I'll let you continue sure. for a bit. Okay. So, um, you know, another, um, in fact, perhaps the most interesting part of the mid-tier API um, is the data block API. And again, this basically came from uh, refactoring. Uh, we looked at uh, lots and lots of examples of data processing pipelines that we had built and that, that our users had built and realized that all of them actually just um, handle um, four steps, um, uh, which the details don't really matter so much, um, but these are the four steps. And so then we created an API where you just say these are the four steps um, and it's called the data block API. So you say, what types of objects do you wanna create? So I wanna create a Python imaging library, black and white image and a category. Um, how do you get the items for those? Uh, how do you split them into training and validation set? And how do you label them? Um, and then where does the information come from? And then, so for example, now that we've got that data block, we can um, display a batch of it. And you can now see there's the actual pictures of images and there's their category. So that's the image black and white and the category. Um, so um, this is one of the key reasons that the, um, uh, the high level API is so consistent across different um, applications is that they're all behind the scenes using the data block API. So um, we can do custom labeling. So for example, here we're, we're doing um, prediction of um, pet breeds. Um, we can do multiple labeling. Um, and this is quite interesting, right? For, for segmentation, we just have to say, okay, now my, to, my types are a Python imaging library image and a Python imaging library mask. And all the other steps are basically the, uh, are the same. But now show batch automatically will show us segmentation information. So we can do the same thing for where's the center of people's face. This is a key points problem and you can see it's the same thing. Now my independent variable is a Python imaging library image and my dependent variable is a, a tensor representing a point. Um, same thing for object detection, uh, same thing for um, text labeling uh, and so forth. So um, that mid-tier API um, uh, depends on the, the, the low level API foundation. Um, and one in particular, which you might have been getting a sense of in that data blocks examples, is um, object-oriented tensors. Um, object-oriented programming is is not exactly new at this point. 
Um, but in um, every deep learning library, uh, other than fast AI, as, fast, as far as I'm aware, um, and this has been gone through a peer review process, so I think it's somewhat true. Um, every other library, um, a tensor is a tensor. It's just a mathematical um, uh, multi-dimensional array of numbers. It has no semantics. Um, but fast AI introduces a complete object hierarchy of tensors. So there are tensors representing images, tensors representing points, tensors representing bounding boxes, and so forth. And so when you say uh, flip left right, uh, it, it just works uh, regardless of what kind of thing you're flipping, for instance. And it's really important to have this semantics carried around because, because you want to be able to visualize the information, you want to be able to make predictions on the information, you want to understand what the information is. And different types of object also work differently together. So you can see here, actually, we're using um, uh, a single dispatch uh, to, oh, sorry, actually, no, we're doing patching here. So we're, we're basically inserting this into each of these classes, um, uh, and then we're calling it um, with a single method, which will work polymorphically. Um, so then um, we can create, for instance, a flip item random transform that just calls flip LR. Um, and it's going to work for every data type uh, as long as it has a, a flip LR method. So this is all obvious stuff for our programmers, but hasn't existed for tensors before. Um, this is the secret to why we can say show batch and get totally different behavior um, of, uh, for example, for segmentation, we see color-coded uh, pixels. Uh, whereas for multi-class labeling, we see um, images along with multiple labels. Um, we can even do things like show results, which will even highlight in red those where the prediction was different to the actual. So again, these are tensors that know how to display themselves. Um, they don't only know how to display themselves, they also know how to display themselves in combination with other types. And the way we do that is with, with multiple dispatch, um, which is basically um, stolen from Julia. Um, although I think I first came across the idea when it was developed by Damien Conway for Pearl um, some decades ago. Um, and the idea is that you can uh, say, um, add a type dispatch decorator and say my method uh, has, this is the first type will be tensor image and the second type is tensor category. And now if you call show results with something of these types, it will automatically dispatch to this function. And that's the secret to why we can have different things passed in and get totally different um, visualizations, for example. Um, uh, another key refactoring was realizing that, um, I guess, it's, uh, is there a refactoring? I'm not exactly sure the right description, but we basically realized that um, a key thing to actually think stuff like visualization working properly and OO um, tensors working properly is that you need to be able to undo the transformations that occur in your data processing. Because to actually pass a tensor to a model, um, it has to be normalized, it has to be reshaped, um, it has to be kind of modified in a number of ways that make it quite hard to work with directly. So we wanted to be able to undo it. So we created a, a thing called transform, um, which uh, has both an encode, which is like, how do you, what does the transform do? But it's also invertible, uh, which is decode, which is how do you undo it? Um, uh, there's a number of other things that tr turns out that transforms have to be able to do to work effectively um, as part of a deep learning pipeline. And it's a somewhat, it's just a little bit different to how normal Python functions and Python dispatch works. But because Python is so powerful as a dynamic environment, we were able to actually create a new type that has different dispatch and function call behavior um, in the language itself, which is really nice. Um, since I'm running a little low on time, I won't describe um, the details. Um, and then finally, um, thanks really to PyTorch, we were able to build, uh, and to Python more generally, we were able to build this on a very fast foundation. Um, so we uh, built some new parallelization primitives, which allowed us to do a lot of the uh, transformation work um, in parallel in a pretty high performance way. Um, without users having to think about it critically. 
Um, and uh, um, everything possible runs on the GPU, um, even things like um, image transformations. And this is really thanks to um, PyTorch's powerful set of primitives. And we build some things on top of that, such as uh, affine coordinate transforms um, that allow us to do a really wide range of transformations uh, on the GPU. And again, the, the user, the developer, doesn't have to think about it. Uh, they just um, use the code and you know, expect it to, to not only work, but to work fast. So I know you said there were some more questions, Hamel. We've got another few minutes, so I thought I might finish yeah, there. Um, one really popular question is, um, what is your advice on maintaining models once they're deployed, process of retraining, versioning, redeploying, all that stuff? You know, that tends to be really complicated from a software engineering perspective that people tend to struggle with uh, when they're trying to, you know, deploy these models into production. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got some comments on that in our book, <laughs> given the time, I'm not sure I've got, I can, I can go into as much detail as I'd like. Um, but basically the key thing for deployment, um, so there's a few key things. One is to keep deployment as simple as possible. There's a lot of complexity in deployment around nowadays with things like, um, you know, TensorFlow ter serving or torch serve or whatever, and ONX, all this stuff. Um, I would try to avoid wherever possible all of the serving specific things um, and wherever possible try to make your model just a standard um, fast AI or PyTorch. I mean, all, all fast AI models are also PyTorch models. So it ends up being a standard PyTorch model um, that you just call as a regular Python function. Um, keep it as simple as possible. Um, run it on the CPU if possible and not the GPU unless you really need to scale uh, for inference. Um, and then, um, so then you can kind of keep a really fast iteration between realizing in production that there's things you want to improve and then experimenting with new approaches and then getting them straight into production quickly. Um, you also need to make sure you've got a really good, um, monitoring system that, uh, makes really good use of people. Um, so there should be plenty of people that are that are using the things where your model is a part of it, people in your organization, um, trying to find all the ways in which it's doing something that's unexpected or stupid, um, you know, trying out out of, you know, unexpected different kind of data, stuff like that. Um, um, but yeah, I really think that the key is to try to maximize the, the iteration speed and minimize the complexity. That makes sense. One more question. Um, do you have any advice for people that are uh, wanting to introduce MB Dev into their workplace? And you know, people might not be familiar with fast AI um, or have any of that context. Do you have any advice on how they might be most effective in trying to do that? Um, so, I mean, it, it, it is a difficult discussion because um, NB Dev and our whole approach to programming is founded on the idea that um, dynamic programming languages like Python should be used dynamically. Um, so, and and Jupyter is a great environment to do that kind of work because Jupyter gives you actual live objects that you're actually introspecting and working with. Um, traditional programming systems don't, uh, like uh, VS Code and stuff like that. Um, so for people that have spent decades learning a certain way of coding, it can seem like wrong, <laughs> you know, it, and, and, and threatening. Um, uh, it, and, you know, so it, I, I think the trick is to try to do it in a small way initially. And, you know, remember with NB Dev, you can always, um, with a single button export an actual Python library. So in a sense, nobody need know <laughs> um, that you're using NB dev. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe then you can kind of say to people like, oh, you know how I did this quicker than you expected? Well, I use this thing called NB dev and here's how it helped me. And look, I've even got documentation and tests have all come out of it. And so maybe, yeah, once people can see from a small use case that it's actually been helpful, um, they, 
might help get past the initial skepticism. What do you think, you introduced a lot of software engineering principles um, like, you know, that are very common here, like uh, being dry, having good defaults, so on and so forth. What are like the most common things you find missing in, in uh, big deep learning projects or machine learning projects out there when, when you look at them? And what, what software engineering principles do you think are, are lacking most often? Uh, I would say refactoring and decoupling you know, uh, together. So I find, um, you know, at an, at an algorithmic level that the, the algorithms tend to be implemented in single huge functions um, without thinking that like they're actually composed of a number of pieces. Um, and then each kind of paper that gets implemented or thing that gets tried tends to be done in this kind of way. It's like, okay, let's put all of those things and put it in this project. And then there's a different thing. We put all of those and put it in this project. And so things ended up, everything ends up tightly coupled and it really slows down the ability to iterate and experiment. And it also really reduces the research insights and kind of performance insights you get because you're not really trying things out independently, but just kind of throwing everything together. Makes sense. Um, Want to be mindful of time? How, do we have time to keep going? I guess we've got done our hour, so we should probably wrap up. Is my guess. Yep. Well, thanks. Thanks so much to both of you. Uh, we have run out of time today. I'd just like to thank uh, Jeremy for his wonderful uh, and insightful presentation today, and Hamel for um, expert moderation. Uh, and a special thanks for each and every one of you for taking the time to attend and participate. This talk was recorded and will be available online uh, in the next day or so. And uh, you can check learning.acm.org as well as acm.org on announcements on future tech talks. Also, if you could take a, a minute to fill out our quick survey where you can suggest uh, future topics or speakers, uh, that would be very helpful and you should see that on your screen in a moment. Uh, on behalf of myself and the ACM, uh, Jeremy Howard and Hamel Hussein, thanks again to everybody for joining and I hope you'll join again in the future. Uh, this concludes today's talk.